Professor DeWisha, members of the Council, guests and friends, on behalf of the trustees of the Council, it's my great pleasure to welcome you this evening. Uh, let me thank the Mercantile Safe Deposit and Trust Company for tonight's reception. Let me also remind you that our next program is on October the 6th in this room. Professor Shibley. Uh, Tahani will speak to us on the topic of Arab the Arab-Israeli conflict, why the end is near. And as, <laughs> as, of course, 30 or 40 years ago, the, the, the accepted wisdom of the academic community was that there would be no end, that it was an <laughs> eternal conflict, that it's Amazing that a serious scholar today can take a position which is as optimistic uh, as does Professor Tehani. He's the Anwar Sadat Professor of Peace and Development at the University of Maryland at College Park, of course. Well, our, our topic tonight is the survival of Saddam Hussein and America's war on Iraq. And as we sit here, in a sense, the United States is conducting a kind of war on Iraq with the purpose of the Rum Hussein. When that became the centerpiece or driving principle of American foreign policy, many observers felt that it ended the path of accommodation and diplomacy as an alternative. Many felt that it clouded all diplomatic uh, uh, areas of needed agreement, that it ultimately raised moral questions of intervention and a series of questions about the theory of sovereignty in a proper working international system and of course the the issue of workability and the consequences and risks of such a policy and many other general questions which are complex and intertwined but we're fortunate tonight to help us clarify all of this and uh, order our thinking uh, we have with us a very distinguished scholar with a broad background in the Middle East and a deep understanding of Iraq. Professor DeWisha was born in Baghdad, educated in England, holds a BA from the University of Lancaster. His PhD is from the London School of Economics and Political Science. He's taught at a number of British universities. He's been a senior fellow at the Institute, the International Institute for Strategic Studies. He's been Deputy Director of Studies at the Royal Institute of International Affairs, a visiting professor at the Pauli Nitze School of International Studies, Johns Hopkins in Washington, of course. He's been a visiting fellow in the Department of Near Eastern Studies at Princeton, a consulting fellow with the Council on Foreign Relations, and since 1985, Professor of Government and Politics at the George Mason University. His many honors have included an International Security Fellowship at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, Fulbright Fellowship for Research in Cairo. He's published over 60 chapters and articles, and his four books are Egypt in the Arab World, The Elements of Foreign Policy, Saudi Arabia's Search for Security, Syria and the Lebanese Crisis, The Arab Radicals. He's been editor and contributor to five, uh, uh, five other books, 
dealing with the Soviet Union in the Middle East, more recently, of course, Russia and the new states in, uh, in Eurasia, and uh, questions of the stability of Arab uh, uh, nations. He's written articles for all the elite media, both in London and, uh, or England and the United States. He's appeared on all the major uh, radio uh, and TV networks. In short, his credentials as a serious scholar and as a commentator are impeccable. So it's my great pleasure to present to you Professor Adi Dawasha. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the last time I heard uh, such a lengthy introduction uh, was about uh, 15, I think, 15 years ago at uh, the Council on Foreign Relations in, uh, in New York. Uh, when David Rockefeller introduced uh, Henry Kissinger. <laughs> I, I feel I, I really have to say something at this point. My, my favorite thing about long uh, comments uh, is when uh, uh, Charles Percy, newly junior senator from the state of Illinois, introduced the senior senator, Everett McKinley Dirksen. And he said, E is for, et cetera, V is for, people groaned and left the room. <laughs> Hubert Humphrey was the next speaker, and he, and he stood up and he said, my name is Hubert Horatio Humphrey. <laughs> but please. Actually, in that meeting with uh, Kissinger, um, I, at the end of, of uh, David Rockefeller's 10-minute uh, or 15-minute introduction uh, to uh, Kissinger, uh, Kissinger stood up, uh, looked at uh, Rockefeller and said, uh, uh, David, if uh, my father had been here and heard you introducing me like that, he would have said that this was a typical case of a British understatement. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for the <laughs> introduction. Um, I'll, what I will do, I think, I was thinking about how to approach the subject, and I thought what I will do is to actually start with looking at uh, the objectives of the United States. Uh, first, because this is what, uh, what Frank Bird actually wanted me to talk about, and I said, why don't we just put in something about Saddam's survival? So I'll start with that, but also, it's a, it's a good way of, uh, of, in a sense, moving on to an examination of the chances of uh, Saddam's uh, survival. Uh, in other words, we look at what America is trying to do, uh, and we'll see whether this is working or, uh, or, uh, or not. I warn you, I'm first and foremost an academic. Um, and uh, as uh, you probably know, academics will never come down on uh, any one uh, alternative. So if you're looking for me to say, what should America do? I don't think you'll get that. I'm a typical on the one hand, yet on the other hand, yet on the other hand. So <laughs> I'll give you all the options that are there, and then you, why don't you make your own uh, mind about what we should be doing about Saddam? Uh, it seems to me that the United States is following three objectives in the, uh, in the area vis-a-vis -vis the Iraqis. Two had been pretty long-standing. Uh, since uh, the end of, immediately after the end of the, of the war. Uh, and the third is uh, more recent. Well, when I say more recent, I don't mean uh, more recent as an objective. I, I think that probably we've had that, this objective since the beginning of the, uh, since the end of the war. But I mean, re when, I mean when I say recent, I mean art recently articulated, that we have been actually uh, uh, saying that this is our objective. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at these, uh, at these uh, three. The first objective, which again we've had since the uh, war, uh, war ended, was, uh, w has been in a sense a primary concern, and that is the elimination of the weapons of mass uh, destruction. Uh, we worked uh, diligently with the United Nations on that uh, through uh, creating a, a pretty uh, extensive inspection regime in, uh, in Iraq. And generally speaking, this is, uh, they have been uh, pretty successful. Um, the, uh, the, the, inspect the inspectors had been in Iraq continuously since, uh, since the, uh, the end of the, of the war, up until last December. 
Uh, it's, they stopped last December when the Iraqis expelled them once and for all. And at, the, uh, at present, Iraq's position is very clear. They will not take any more uh, inspectors. Uh, and if the only, and if, uh, the only way that they will be uh, relenting is if uh, the United States and the United Nations uh, lift the uh, sanctions all uh, altogether. Uh, during its stay in Iraq, the uh, inspectors uh, were successful in, in eliminating, uh, at least in making sure that Iraq's nuclear capability, which was pretty substantial before 1991, uh, is uh, almost gone. I mean, I think there is, there is almost unanimous acceptance that Iraq no longer has a nuclear uh, capability. However, this is not the case uh, with uh, Iraq's uh, biological or chemical capability. I mean, again, there is almost unanimous acceptance that Iraq does have uh, uh, some capability, depending on who you, who you talk to. Some would say substantial, some would say reduced. But there's no doubt that uh, in terms of biological and chemical weapons, uh, Iraq does have a capability. Whether the Iraqis are capable of producing uh, these weapons, at least not just producing them, but uh, carrying them uh, to, uh, to, other, to targets, uh, whether they could do it within six months, a year, or three years, is, is open to, uh, to question. But I don't know of anyone who, who, who says that uh, uh, Ira uh, Iraq's uh, biological and chemical uh, capability has, uh, has, has gone. So they have scored... Uh, you know, some success uh, in, uh, in eliminating the nuclear menace that uh, Iraq was, uh, was, was posing. Uh, what's happening uh, now, again, everything is in hiatus because of this kind of standoff between uh, the uh, United States uh, stroke United Nations and, uh, and Iraq. The Iraqis are adamant that they will not accept any more inspections and that the time has come for sanctions to be lifted because the Iraqis uh, argue uh, that uh, the inspectors have found all there is to be found. Uh, that is, of course, not the case, but uh, it's very difficult uh, to, prove them, uh, to prove them wrong. The second objective that uh, we have held again since uh, the end of the uh, war is the kind of um, uh, protection of uh, the populations in Iraq uh, that are, uh, have been anti-Saddam since the uh, uh, the end of the uh, of the of the war, and I mean by that specifically the Kurdish population in the north of Iraq and the Shiite population in the south of uh, south of Iraq. What we have done there, as you know, is to uh, create two uh, zones, uh, a southern one and a northern one, uh, in which uh, in, in which we have tried to, in a sense, uh, keep these populations uh, protected from uh, from the. Uh, from the central government, uh, from Saddam's uh, army, from Saddam's cronies. This has been less successful in, uh, in the south because what we have in the south is a no-fly zone. In other words, uh, we will not allow any Iraqi aircraft to fly over this, uh, this zone. The moment they fly, we shoot them uh, down. But the Iraqis can actually use their ground forces to, uh, to operate in the south, and, and, and uh, Saddam's regime has been very active uh, in... Uh, uh, terrorizing and intimidating the population in the south by using some uh, uh, pretty, uh, pretty terrible uh, kind of uh, uh, methods uh, of, uh, of terror. Um, <coughs> in the north, it has been more successful because there we, we have not just a no-fly zone, but essentially a no-entry zone. In other words, the Iraqis are prevented from going into the, uh, into the northern uh, sector, either th by, uh, by, through airplanes, but also by ground forces. So the population uh, in the north, basically the Kurdish population, is literally protected from, uh, from, uh, from Iraq. Uh, fr and, and they have been allowed, uh, as a result, to carry on their, their life, but also uh, not just uh, to live in peace, but also to create political institutions. So they have a government, they have a cabinet, uh, they have a kind of uh, a parliament uh, which uh, meets, uh, which meets, uh, you know, in uh, in the north in a, in, a, in a city, in the northern uh, city, and one is not very, one is not does not know whether this is going to continue, uh, to some kind of a semi-political status for that area, or uh, whether in the future it could be incorporated in a uh, in a kind of um, uh, in the same way that the Palestinian so-called entity is uh, at the moment uh, operating as a semi-independent uh, uh, unit within, uh, within Israel. Uh, this thing is open to question. The Kurds, uh, the Kurds 
I think deep down, would very much like to have their own state. Uh, but they, but uh, in terms of uh, their public announcements and pronouncements, they say no. And uh, the international community, I think, is not very uh, clear about that. But whatever it is, certainly they have been protected and they have been allowed to develop uh, their own uh, political institutions. Uh, problems, however, do uh, continue to, to bedevil this, uh, this arrangement in the north, primarily, not, not because of us, uh, primarily because of the Kurds themselves. The Kurds are divided into uh, major uh, factions and tribes, and there have been two major, uh, two primary factions that have been at each other's uh, head, I mean, uh, the, uh, uh, the Talabani faction and the Barazani faction. Uh, these have been, uh, these two uh, 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 groups have been fighting each other and more worrying for the United States, not just uh, fighting each other, but seeking outside alliances. Uh, so at, in one, uh, at one stage you would see the Barazani faction uh, kind of allying itself with the, uh, with the uh, Iraqi regime, while the Talibani faction allies itself with, uh, with Iran. And that's something we could well do without. The other problem in the north is Turkey, of course. Uh, Turkey has its own very substantial Kurdish minority, uh, which uh, has, 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 has been a, a, a source of major uh, concern for the, uh, for the Turks. The Turks have been waging a war against, the, uh, against their Kurdish population for a long time, and it has intensified over the last uh, five or six years. Uh, and the Turks are, v are adamantly, adamantly against any... Uh, kind of uh, independence for the uh, for the Kurds because they fear that if there if any movement occurs in the Iraqi side this will spill over into uh, into Turkey thus creating uh, a major destabilizing force so the Tur the Turks have been uh, uh, adamantly against uh, what's been uh, happening in terms of uh, in terms of Iraq even though interestingly enough at certain times they tactically have allied themselves with the Iraqi Kurds against their own, uh, own Kurds. But there again, the situation is very fluid and is liable to create problems uh, for, uh, for us. The third objective uh, that the United States has, and this is the one that I said is recently articulated, um, is the overthrow of Saddam Hussein. Now, I believe that we've had this objective since day one, uh, since the, the Kuwait crisis uh, began. But we've been pretty coy about articulating it, about saying that uh, this has been, uh, this has been a, an, a, an objective. Only about two years ago did we, in a sense, gradually work our way to come out in the open and say, yes, this is what, we're, uh, what we want to do and this is what we intend to do. And we're following this, uh, this uh, objective. We're trying to achieve it through three kind of uh, av uh, avenues. The first, by keeping the, uh, the zones uh, under, under our control. I mean, basically, the idea that you're going to cut off Iraq into three sections, two of which is more or less under American uh, control, or at least uh, two of which the Iraqis can, can't uh, uh, get to without some kind of punishment, in a sense, certainly undermines and weakens the central government in, in Iraq. I mean, Saddam Hussein now has total control over no more than 31% of the entire country. The rest is, uh, is not under his, uh, his government control. The North is not under his control at all. The South under some control by the, uh, by the Iraqis, and, that, and that's supposed to be, and I suppose in a sense is, uh, a kind of a, um, uh, a weakening of, the, uh, of, Saddam, of Saddam Hussein. If there are not many governments uh, go around for a long time controlling only one-third of the land mass that they're supposed to have jurisdiction over. Uh, the second avenue in which we're trying to do that is by, of course, economic sanctions. And this is the most, one of the, the most controversial uh, issues that we have. Uh, what are the sanctions really doing what they're supposed, uh, supposed to be doing? Uh, the, United, the sanctions, by the way, is not American. I mean, a lot of people think we are imposing the sanctions. The sanctions is United Nations. The United Nations sa sanctions is, as, uh, you know, done by the Security, uh, Security Council. But there is no doubt that of the members of the Security Council, certainly the five permanent members, the United States is by far the most militant in continuing the uh, sanctions uh, to, uh, on, uh, uh, on, on Iraq. Uh, these sanctions have uh, been uh, relaxed somewhat over the last uh, two years, 
uh, because we've allowed the Iraqis to sell some of their uh, oil, in fact, all of their oil if they could, uh, in return for food and medical equipment and some other, uh, some other material. And this has recently, last year, been expanded to $10 billion. In other words, the Iraqis have the right to sell oil up to the tune, to the tune of $10 billion, $10,000 million. And then with that money, in a sense, um, uh, not with, the, with all of it, but about 60% of it, because the rest, 40% goes to uh, war reparations, Kuwait, and so on and so forth. 60% uh, of that, so about $6 billion, the Iraqis can use to buy um, you know, food, medicine, and, and, uh, and, uh, and other equipment. Up until recently, by the way, the Iraqis have not been able to, uh, uh, to sell $10 billion worth of oil. I mean, they don't have the capability, uh, given that their, much of their uh, oil, at least many of their installations, have been inoperative since the Iraq-Iran war at the beginning of the 1980s. Uh, but uh, with the recent increase in the, uh, in the oil prices, about I think yesterday was 23 and a half, uh, 23 uh, and a half dollars a barrel, probably now they, they could uh, sell up to uh, 10 billion, uh, 10 billion dollars. Um, <coughs> there has been again talk and especially initiative coming up from the other members of the, from the other permanent members, especially Russia and France, uh, that these restrictions should be further relaxed. Not so much in terms of the money, although they, they wouldn't mind uh, you know, making it into $15 billion, but uh, what they really want to uh, relax uh, are the restrictions on the types of things that they can buy with the, uh, with the oil. Uh, basically things like spare parts, you know, tires, uh, mechanical equipments for tractors, uh, and, and for, for, uh, you know, for, for other things like, uh, like that. Uh, the, uh, the Americans have been very wary about that because they're afraid of two things. One is that once you start, uh, once you start relaxing these restrictions, it's uh, almost it's it's more like a spillover effect. You relax it up to this point, and then within three months they'll say, "Why don't we go a little bit further? Why don't we go a little bit further?" And so on and so forth. Is that uh, the the whole kind of concept of the sanctions regime loses its uh, its meaning? They're also worried that um, some, if you relax, if you relax the, the restrictions beyond food and medicine, and you go into kind of mechanical equipment, then the Iraqis might use that for their, say, armed forces or for their police or for their security forces and things like that. And, and of course, this is something which we uh, don't uh, want uh, don't want happen. Uh, they're also worried that. If you allow uh, restrictions, then basically uh, the uh, Saddam Hussein can, uh, can uh, in a sense, uh, use that to bolster his own position in Iraq. In other words, take a, a percentage of whatever uh, increases and, and, you, and gives it to his own men, to, uh, to the security forces, to the army, to his supporters in Iraq at the expense of the population in, in Iraq, which is, the, which is, the, who, which is the, 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 the kind of the target of these uh, res uh, relaxation. Of, uh, of restrictions. Um, <coughs> the Americans, therefore, uh, are the most militant in keeping the sanctions as where they are and trying not to relax them anymore. And they are the most militant in making, trying to make absolutely sure that Saddam cannot use any of uh, the stuff that's going his, uh, his way uh, as a result of, uh, uh, of the $10 billion to his own people. Uh, the problem with this is that this has led to great delays <coughs> uh, in uh, passing, uh, passing these uh, vital equipments to the, uh, to the Iraqis. So that even over things like food or like medicine, uh, we insist that we have to have be absolutely certain uh, that, these th that these foodstuffs and medicine are going to the population of Iraq and not siphoned off by Saddam and his cronies uh, for his own supporters or to hoard and then sell and then give to the uh, Iraqi population uh, them, uh, themselves. And while, while I can understand why they're doing that, Nevertheless, what's happening is that, again, great delays, things are not going through, they're spending a lot of time until, until the food is, uh, is, uh, uh, hits uh, the markets and so on, and Saddam Hussein is blaming it all on the United, uh, on the United uh, States. And we'll, I'll come to that uh, presently. Okay, so these are the three objectives uh, of the United States uh, that we've been, uh, we've been following. 
And most interesting to, uh, to me is the third one, is that all this, uh, the, uh, the efforts to, uh, to uh, kind of uh, weaken, uh, weaken Saddam Hussein and unseat him. The idea here being is that all of these uh, three uh, objectives are, should, should aim towards undermining Saddam's status, his control of, uh, of Iraq, and therefore uh, basically uh, getting rid of him. So, what effect are these objectives having on uh, Saddam Hussein and in his, on, his, uh, on his survival? Let me just put that so I know I don't go beyond 45 minutes. <clears throat> how does Saddam Hussein survive? How, do, how, do these dic how does any dictator survive? It is because there is a, a kind of very clear philosophical and, and intellectual distinction uh, in terms of governments surviving in, uh, in, uh, in office. So more than governments, political systems surviving in, uh, in office. And the distinction is between is what we call pluralist systems, which are democracies, and authoritarian systems, which are uh, dic uh, uh, d dictatorships. Now, I don't want to talk about democracies. We live in one. We know why our government is, is legitimate. I mean, you may like or dislike Bill Clinton. Uh, this is irrelevant. What is legitimate is not Bill Clinton. What is legitimate is the political system. And whatever legitimacy Clinton has, he, he in a sense, gets uh, because we believe the, uh, the, you know, the political system that we have uh, is legitimate. This, of course, does not happen in dictatorships. Legitimacy there does not lie with the system, with the political system. It lies with the person himself, whoever is ruling the, uh, the, uh, the country. And these guys, therefore, survive in, uh, in office through two avenues. One is pure brute force, right? coercion. Uh, I do not know of a single dictator who is, could be called a nice dictator. Even though Jean Kirkpatrick thought there were some nice dic uh, dictators, and she, uh, she mentioned uh, General Pinochet as being one of the nice guys, right? <laughs> dictators, by their very natures, are not nice people. Uh, the only way they can remain in power is by uh, force, by basically intimidating, terrorizing, and brutalizing their, uh, their popu uh, population. However, that is not the only way that they stay in power along with the brute force, along with coercion, they also try very hard to, in a sense, gain the acceptance of their, of their people, right? What is there to lose? Why shouldn't they do that? In other words, you know, yeah, I, I have w this pillar of force that I can rely on, but it's much better and, and much, uh, uh, much stronger if I can have another pillar, which is basically trying to win the support of the people. Well, lacking democratic institutions, how do they try to win the support of their people? They try to do it by becoming, or at least appearing to their own population as being meritorious leaders. That this guy is meritorious, that he delivers the good. He, he does well economically, you know, uh, he's good at keeping trains run on time. Uh, he builds roads, build, uh, builds uh, uh, schools in Iraq, which is a very rich uh, country in the, in the 1970s. Um, uh, every single kid uh, from the day he is born until the day he finishes uh, college does not pay a single penny towards his, uh, his upkeep, towards his, uh, uh, his education, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, when Saddam Hussein took over in, the, in 1968, uh, about 70 percent of Iraq wa did not have electricity. By the end of the 1970s, 10 years later, all of Iraq was, electrif uh, was electrified, or was, what is the word? <laughs> they may have been electrified, <laughs> too. <laughs> all right. Uh, electricity kind of was all over the, uh, the, the place. So you go into these kind of small shanty towns in the middle of nowhere and you see the television antenna and you see them having refrigerators and so on and so forth, all right? Th these are the kind of things that dictators do to win the support of the population, lacking the existence of democratic uh, institu uh, institutions. So th on these two pillars, Saddam Hussein built his, uh, his survival mechanism. And without doubt, I mean, you know, uh, people kind of now think of him as being a brute, uh, a brute uh, hated and so on and so forth. Uh, people forget that in the 1970s, he probably was the most popular Arab leader uh, in, the, in the entire uh, area amongst his own population as well as the rest of the Arab world. So that his reputation of having done all these great things for Iraq went beyond Iraq. And a lot of people in Egypt and in Yemen and so on 
uh, would, in a sense, try to compare their own <coughs> uh, leaders with, uh, with uh, Saddam Hussein. This second pillar began to crumble uh, around the early middle 1980s through the, because of the Iraq-Iran war. Uh, once he plunged ir uh, Iraq into the war with, uh, with Iran, and once the war with Iran began to uh, really eat into Iraq's economic structure, which had provided all these goodies to the, uh, to the Iraqis, his, in a sense, that notion of, of success began to, uh, to recede. And of course, the, you know, the, the nail in the coffin came with the Gulf War and then with the biting economic sanctions uh, that uh, followed that. And nobody in Iraq now thinks that Saddam Hussein is a successful or a meritorious, uh, meritorious, uh, uh, meritorious leader. <coughs> uh, so from around late 1980s, but certainly, certainly from 1991, 92 up until today, Saddam Hussein survives because he uses force to survive. I mean, the pillar of merit has gone completely. The only pillar which he now has is the pillar of, uh, of force. And, and there are two kinds of, uh, of coercion that he uses. Uh, you know, people always think of force as being, you know, uh, uh, police, policemen going, beating up people and so on, of course. But there's another, uh, another uh, force that he, another kind of, co kind of coercion that he uses. But let's look first at the, uh, at the physical coercion. Uh, Iraq today literally rests on a bewildering array of security services that interlap and overlap with each other. The number is up in the air. Some people will tell you there's at least 30, 35 security services, state security services. Some people say there are as, as, uh, as many as uh, 80, 85. All of these security services are doing one thing and one thing only, and that is trying to keep Saddam Hussein in power. They are not just uh, kind of um, trying to keep a tab on the population. They're also keep, they keep a tab on each other. If you just have one security service, you're in big trouble because if this security service turns against you, but if you have a lot of them, then every single uh, one in these security service is looking over his shoulder to see what the guy from the other security service is doing. And, that's, and this kind of, uh, this, the, uh, <coughs> this environment of fear pervades not just the Iraqi population, but also the very services that are supposed to keep him in, uh, in power. Uh, again, <coughs> no one knows, but, uh, but those who watch Iraq would say that uh, the probably in, uh, amongst the Iraqis today, one out of every four uh, Iraqis is somehow employed by, works for, or has contacts with the security uh, uh, services. So the entire population is literally terrorized into uh, sub, uh, submission. <coughs> uh, the bulk of the members of the security service tend to come from the city and the town uh, from which uh, Saddam Hussein comes, uh, the town of, uh, of Tikrit. And they have this kind of very strong uh, village, almost tribal bonds uh, that, uh, that kind of uh, bind them together. The overall head of the security, of all the security uh, services that exist in Iraq is Saddam's second cousin, uh, second son, uh, um, in younger son. He has two sons. The younger son, a, a man by the name of Qusay. Qusay heads, he's the kind of titular head of all of these security uh, services. Qusay is also responsible for the presidential guard. Um, a crack, uh, a crack uh, division and a half, two division strength uh, kind of uh, for, uh, force that is basically responsible for the protection of uh, Saddam, uh, of Saddam Hussein. Uh, <coughs> Another force uh, that this time comes under the uh, under the under the leadership of uh, Saddam's other uh, son, the older son Uday, is called Saddam's Martyrs. Uh, these Saddam's martyrs are supposed to be around 60, 70,000 men, mainly from uh, kind of the poor uh, sectors of uh, Iraq, people who supposedly had benefited from Saddam's earlier economic policies. Uh, and uh, it's a motley bunch uh, that it's sort of uh, given some kind of a training over a period of two, three months and given uh, uh, 
uh, kind of uh, guns and, and weapons and so on. And the idea is that if there is any threat to the regime, they could be called on a on a on a on a you know literally moment's notice, and they'll come to the they'll come to the uh, to the streets and in a sense uh, defend their beloved leader uh, Saddam Hussein. It's not very clear how effective this force is, but in terms of publicity and propaganda, it's very important. I mean, if you think in terms of the of in terms of the Iraqi population. One of the main things that keeps them, uh, keeps them where they are is this kind of fear, is this perception that Saddam Hussein uh, has control all, over, over everything. And the more you kind of instill this notion of fear, the more you instill this idea that you cannot, you can never uh, get to Saddam because he has all these groups uh, that are going to uh, fight to the death uh, uh, to protect him, uh, the, of course, the, 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 the the less your inclination will be to rise against uh, Saddam. So whether the 60,000 Saddam's martyr mean anything, when, when there is, if and when there is a major rebellion, uh, one does not know, but that's not the point. The point is that they have, in a sense, instilled in the minds of the Iraqis yet another element of fear uh, to keep them uh, 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 subdued. The other kind of, uh, the other coercion, as we said, there are two kinds of coercion, which people, the second one, don't, people, think, uh, people don't usually think of because we tend to live in a society like this, is what I call intellectual coercion. Uh, this is the kind of coercion which these dictators have in these countries and which is, in a sense, perfected. It reaches an epitome in Saddam's Iraq, and that is the complete and utter control of the sources of information. Uh, Saddam is controls the TV, they control the radio, all the newspapers are government owned and controlled by, uh, by uh, Saddam Hussein and the per in fact m more so by his son Uday, uh, the guy who is in charge of, the, uh, of, the, of, ma of Saddam's martyr. He tends, he's increasingly becoming the, uh, the kind of the, um, the press overlord, the Rupert Murdoch of, uh, of, uh, of Iraq. You know, he owns, uh, he, he owns uh, the, uh, the, uh, the television, a major television station, a, a radio station, and uh, a newspaper and a, maga uh, and a magazine. And no other newspaper, magazine, or TV, or radio can do anything without first referring to, uh, uh, to him. So there's complete blanketing of news uh, in, uh, in, in Iraq. And all the information that the Iraqis get tend to, uh, tend to kind of, they tend to receive from these, uh, from these uh, uh, institutions. Now, of course, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the benefits of the sanctions that we have placed on, uh, on, the, uh, on the Iraqis is that they are now incapable of jamming, which they used to do before, but now they're incapable of jamming foreign uh, broadcasts. Uh, so that uh, the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, uh, the uh, Voice of America, uh, this new Voice of Free Iraq, which, uh, which the Americans have put in the north and is beaming uh, information at the Iraqis, uh, you know, a French uh, station which is very popular in the Middle East called Radio Monte Carlo, all of these now reach the Iraqis. And Saddam Hussein, because of the sanctions, they, I mean, the regime does not have uh, the, uh, the resources to uh, stop uh, these, uh, these um, uh, stations getting to Iraq. And as a result of that, the Iraqis are pretty, I think, I mean, uh, they're, they're pretty aware of what's happening in the rest of the, uh, of the, of the, of the world. And so, you know, we, we, when we badmouth the sanctions, as we certainly do in certain cases, at least th there are some benefits. And a very clear benefit is this inability of uh, the Iraqi regime to, uh, uh, to jam, uh, to stop the Iraqis from from, from uh, hearing alternative pieces of information. All right, so within this context of how Saddam rules Iraq, how effective are uh, as American, uh, uh, American policy? Well, <coughs> it seems to me that it's been effective in, uh, in, two, uh, in, two way, in two ways. First of all, there is no doubt that this aura of success uh, this idea of a meritorious leader uh, is no longer, uh, it has gone. I mean, th there is no doubt that, as I said earlier, the second pillar of his uh, regime is now completely gone. You know, there, of course, they would not, uh, they would not, uh, they would in no way uh, admit that. 
But I cannot believe there is a single Iraqi today living in Iraq who thinks that his leader is a great, successful, uh, wise uh, leader. I mean, that kind of image which Saddam Hussein had and used uh, to perfection in the 1970s is now completely, uh, completely gone. And, you know, let's face it. American sanctions, the, uh, co the continuous bombardment of, uh, of, uh, of Iraq uh, has, in a sense, contributed to this diminished image. A lot of people think that Saddam Hussein is a, jo is a, is a joke. So when, for example, uh, he, uh, he claims that um, uh, they've downed an American, uh, American plane, nobody believes him. Uh, he, uh, when he kind of uh, says that he's going to give a million and a half uh, uh, dollars worth, worth of uh, Iraqi money to whoever uh, downs an American plane and brings an American pilot, he's a laughing, uh, laughing stock. That is very different from the, from the way that Iraqis perceived Saddam in the 1970s. And certainly it has done the same thing, not just to the Iraqis, but to the rest of the Arab world, who tended to see Saddam as a new, uh, in the 50s and 60s, the Arabs had a, an Egyptian president called President Gamal Abdel Nasser, President Nasser, who in a sense was seen and considered to be one of the greatest Arab leaders ever, and so on and so forth. And Saddam had, in a, for a while, played to, in a sense, to fill that, uh, that position. And in the 70s, a lot of people was, were seeing him as the new Nasser. That is gone. Nobody sees him like that in Iraq or outside, uh, outside uh, Iraq. Uh, the second way it's been effective, uh, in a sense, and this derives from the first, his diminished uh, status and, and uh, prestige has certainly led to a lot of dissension within, the, uh, within, uh, within Iraq. Not so much amongst the population, because I told you, the Iraqi population is completely terrorized and brutalized. But there is no doubt that there is a lot of dissension very clearly within the armed forces. And after all, the American policy, when it says we want to get rid of Saddam Hussein, I don't think they ever thought in terms of a popular revolution by the people, you know, like the, uh, the Iranian revolution of 1979. This has never been a, uh, a kind of a realizable objective. But what they think, and they think in terms of an attempted coup, of, a, of some officer uh, looking at Saddam, seeing that he has become uh, much weaker than, uh, than before, looking at the, what the sanctions is doing to, uh, to Iraq and deciding, I'll take, uh, I'll take my chance. And since 1992, we've had real kind of serious, uh, in terms of serious attempted coups, at least five of those, and God knows how many more. But we've had at least five really serious attempted coups against the, uh, against the regime. What is interesting about that is that almost, not almost, all of them, every single one of them, came from the Republican Guard. The very part of the armed forces that has been seen by the regime and by the outside world as the bulwark of Saddam's main uh, survival mechanism. I mean, the Republican Guard tends to be the, uh, about between uh, eight to 11 divisions, depending on, 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 on what period we're talking, uh, talking about. All of them come from the city of Tikrit, which is his uh, city, and the adjoining areas. The tribes that, that populate the central part of uh, Iraq, most, all of them Sunni tribes, around that area, this is where the recruitment for the Republican Guard uh, comes from. And in the war with the, uh, in the, in the Gulf War, when the Iraqis, in the two or three times that the Iraqis put up some kind of uh, uh, opposition, and f in the two or three times when they actually did fight and fight gallantly, it was the Republican Guard uh, part of the armed forces. Uh, this is a crack, well-trained, uh, highly motivated group because, in a sense, they are bound by this kind of tribal, uh, uh, regional uh, uh, kind of esprit de corps. Uh, and uh, they're, they're supposedly completely loyal to, uh, to, Sad uh, to Saddam. Well, these coups came from within the ranks of the Republican Guards. It didn't come from some disaffected officer, a Shiite officer from the South or a Kurd. It came from these Sunni, highly uh, uh, loyal uh, troops uh, to Iraq. Well, again, that shows that in a way, whatever we're doing is, uh, is working because 10, 15 years ago, this would not have happened. It, we, might, we might have had uh, uh, coups or, or, or some kind of uh, dissension, but not from within the ranks of these, uh, of these uh, people. We also have seen, and I don't want to dwell on that because you will obviously have, gone, uh, have, have listened to that, we've seen that uh, major problems within the family itself. 
uh, his uh, two son, uh, sons-in-law defected in 1995 uh, to, uh, to Jordan, came back and were, were kind of uh, killed in a ritualized uh, fashion and so on and so forth. Uh, lately, his, uh, his, uh, his brother, who had been the, uh, the, the family's uh, financial guru, who's been, who's been, who'd been in, in Switzerland for a very long period and knows all the ins and outs and all the, um, uh, the secrets of, uh, of the bank accounts of the, of the family. There's been a major problem with, uh, with that. He was expelled from, uh, he'd been asked to go back. He refused to go. Then he basically was pushed by the Swiss and now he's out of Iraq again. And, uh, and the reports that we have is that been, there's been a kind of uh, a major move by the regime against anyone who's, who's been associating with him. Again, uh, the, 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 the idea that, uh, that Saddam's own immediate family is going to turn against him was unthinkable 15, 20 years ago, yet it's uh, happening, uh, happening now. Well, that's uh, when it's, it's been effective. Has it been un ineffective? Yeah, it's been ineffective uh, so far, and mainly in terms of what the sanctions are doing to the people of Iraq. Uh, the people who are really suffering in economic terms, in social terms, are the, are the actual population of Iraq and not Saddam Hussein, who, along with his cronies, are living pretty well, thank you very much. I mean, it's the Iraqis, the, peop the people, the very people that, that, this, that the sanctions are supposed to help in kind of uh, bringing about the demise of Saddam are the ones that are really getting it and getting, getting it very, very bad. And I'm not sure that this was the intention of, uh, of the sanctions. Moreover, is that Saddam is winning the public relations battle, war with us over, over this. He's been very successful in pointing uh, this, uh, the miseries of the, uh, of the Iraqi people as uh, being the result of American uh, led sanction regime in the uh, in the area. So what are the solutions? And I will spend only three more minutes on that and because it's much more interesting to have questions and answers. Well, there have been two kind of solutions. A moderate solution and a militant, uh, militant uh, solution. The moderate solution is the one that uh, argues we should expand the relaxation of the sanctions uh, to Iraq. We should, as I said earlier, increase it to maybe $15 billion a year if the Iraqis can, uh, can sell that much oil, uh, relax uh, the, on, the, uh, you know, on the matters that we are selling them. Uh, so what if, uh, if uh, some of the equipment can go into Iraq's uh, military uh, arsenal? So what if he can ha get his hand on 10 or 15 or 20 percent of, what, uh, of, the, of the increase? Uh, this is a cost uh, well, we well worth taking given if we end up winning the public relation uh, war, which we are certainly losing, without any doubt, we're losing not just in Iraq, but in the, in the, uh, in the Arab world. That's the moderate uh, kind of um, uh, solution. The militant one, and I've heard that in a number of uh, meetings, and this is uh, one that is, uh, perp that's kind of uh, perpetrated by uh, some of the ex-Reagan uh, uh, aficionados and, and intellectuals, people like Paul Wolfowitz and uh, uh, Richard Pearl and people like, uh, like that, they, these, are, these, these people say, look, it, the more, this is a real brutal dictator. Brutal dictators know only force. If you relax anything, all he's going to do, you give, him a, you give him a yard, just take a mile. You give him a mile, he'll take the whole country. Don't do that. The only way you're going to be, uh, you should be operating with Saddam Hussein is basically going after him and getting rid of him forcibly. They have an idea, that, the idea that I heard, I mean, if, okay, so you say, so what? How do you do that in, in practical terms? We've been trying to get rid of the guy for the last, you know, eight years and have not succeeded. Well, they say that, in fact, we should be going after him in terms of military forces. The idea is, and maybe it's kind of over long drawn, but you know, it's a, it's a, you could see that it has some practi practicability, is that to uh, stop the South from being just a no-fly zone, but make it a no-entry zone, just like the North. In other, in other words, make the entire South completely unavailable to Saddam's forces. 
just like we do with the, uh, with the North, so that the Shiite population will not be terrorized anymore by Saddam's uh, forces. Then you, try, then you train uh, uh, groups of people from the, uh, from the South, creating a, div a division-strong uh, you know, uh, force with help from the Americans through Kuwait, uh, and, in, and, and then in the future engage Saddam in military confrontations both from the south and the north. The object of the exercise is not to, in a sense, fight him, win, and then go towards Baghdad. That's no longer an option and they accept that. The idea being is that it doesn't matter if you can engage him in, in some military skirmishes as a result of which you find that Saddam's forces lose one or two of these uh, small battles given the fact that he's completely and utterly unpopular and with no support base, his, his base is going to collapse and uh, the whole thing will, in a sense, Im, uh, implode from, uh, from, uh, uh, from within. The idea being is that this could be, could be a, Republican, uh, a Republican kind of uh, pursued policy uh, if, uh, if and when the Republicans come back to, uh, to, uh, to power. But these are the two kind of uh, solutions that are given. And I'll stop here. Uh, and uh, open this for, uh, for uh, questions and answers or comments. I'd be very interested in hearing your, your own comments too. The question is, uh, will there be any political impact from the Pope's visit? Yeah, uh, f those who probably do not know, uh, the Pope is uh, intending, and he has definitely said he will do it, so uh, he's intending to visit the countries of the, uh, of the Middle East to celebrate the uh, second uh, millennium, the 2000 uh, birth of, uh, of uh, Christ. And he wants to start uh, in Iraq because in the, around the, center of the south central part of Iraq in the city of Ur is uh, supposedly, not supposedly, I suppose uh, historically, the uh, city from which Abraham uh, came. And so he wants to trace that kind of journey into Syria, Egypt, and, and uh, present-day Israel, stroke Palestine. Um, we have been trying very hard to uh, stop him doing, uh, doing that. I understand that Pickering was there literally uh, three weeks ago, uh, but he's adamant about doing it. Uh, I can understand what, uh, what he wants to do. It's uh, very understandable. Uh, the only problem is that even if he uh, succeeds, he's going to be there for 54 hours only. And so, uh, you know, when you think in terms of actually making that uh, trip and going to Ur and so on and so forth, you can, you can uh, kind of conceptualize uh, a 54 hours where he doesn't have that much contact with the ruling elite. Uh, but if I know Saddam Hussein, there is no way that Saddam is going to let this go. I mean, he's going to make a major uh, political uh, kind of issue out of, uh, out of, uh, out of that. Um, and uh, again, uh, as a public relations exercise, no matter what happens, it's going to be, in a sense, a victory for, uh, for Saddam, uh, Saddam Hussein. Uh, but uh, as I say, it does not look as though it's not going to go through. I mean, you know. The question is, who would follow <laughs> Hussein? Uh, what is to be gained from eliminating him? Well, uh, one thing which I actually uh, forgot to, uh, to talk about was the opposition outside Iraq. When I said, what, is, wh what are the avenues that the Americans are trying to do to weaken Saddam? One thing which I did not talk about was the fact that they are at, the, at present uh, kind of uh, nurturing a variety of opposition groups, all of which are, in fact, outside Iraq, except apart from, except of, uh, the, um, uh, the, two, the two Kurdish factions who continue to operate in the north of, uh, north of Iraq. Uh, these groups have, uh, have said publicly that uh, if they ever get back to Iraq and establish some kind of political uh, order in Iraq, it's going to be a democratic one, that they are, uh, they are kind of uh, committed to uh, instituting uh, democratic uh, institutions in, uh, in Iraq. Now, uh, if that happens, great, then, then your concern is taken uh, care of. Um, whether it's going to happen is another matter uh, because I, unless we think in terms of the scenario that uh, Wolfowitz and Pearl kind of advocate in which the Americans take, uh, uh, take active uh, part in unseating Saddam, then of course we're going to have a lot of uh, power and authority in, in saying what should happen. And if we can, we can bring these outsiders in, uh, in Iraq, then you can, you can kind of visualize a scenario in which this can, uh, this can happen. 
uh, more to the point and more likely, I agree with you, is some army general uh, carrying a successful coup, uh, a bloody battle with uh, Saddam's, uh, Saddam's uh, supporters, and then taking over power. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, the United States, I mean, I've asked a, a lot of uh, American officials in the National Security Council and the Minister of uh, Defense, State Department, uh, do we, are we going to go publicly and say we will not uh, approve of such a, uh, of such a dictator coming, coming to power? They said, that, and they have been very quiet. In other words, as far as they're concerned, when you say, what do we gain? As far as the American administration is concerned, anything is better than Saddam. The first question was, should President Bush have, gone. have continued to Baghdad and displaced uh, Saddam? Second question, um, can you comment on a complicated scenario of conspiracy between Saddam and the American president, whereby uh, a variety of people, Europeans and Americans, would have economically prospered from this? Two questions. OK, the, f uh, the first one. Uh, emotionally, when I kind of uh, emotionally using, basically uh, using my heart as my signpost, yes, I, I wish they would have done it. I mean, uh, you know, on the 30th, on the, on the 1st of March, 1991, the road to Baghdad was open uh, to Schwarzkopf. And nobody knew where the American forces were because they did a good job on keeping the press uh, out. You know, within t uh, an extra 48 hours, who knows were they in the south, the north, the south. I mean, you know, I think it was within their, their, their power to, uh, to do so. So it's a pity. And uh, I wish they had, uh, they had done it. Uh, however, uh, kind of using my brain, I can understand why he did not uh, do it. I mean, look, I teach my students one very clear maxim, and that is you fight wars along political objectives, not military objectives. You don't fight wars uh, because you can win more. You have political objectives you set for yourself. When you achieve them, you stop. That's the whole essence of uh, fighting war. That's why we always have a civil administration that, rule, that kind of controls the military establishment, who probably would have liked to go and conquer the world. And the whole thing about Korea, about, I mean, I don't want to go into history, but MacArthur and Korea is a classic example of, uh, of, uh, of that. Uh, and Bush had reached his political objective. The political objective was to get rid of the Iraqi forces. He, he expelled them from, uh, uh, from uh, Kuwait. The whole international coalition that we, we spent so much time building was built and predicated on that condition alone, that we liberate Kuwait. Once we, we go beyond that and we say, now we're going to expand the objective into going to Iraq, unseating Saddam and so on, uh, the Arabs would have immediately gone against us. The Muslim world would have immediately gone, uh, gone against us. The whole coalition would have collapsed. If I were sitting in the White House uh, in this, uh, uh, you know, during George Bush days, I think my heart would have told me to go, but my mind would have said, you've got to stop. And I think from that point of view, he made the right political decision. Regrettable as it was, <laughs> it was the right political decision. Now, is there a, cons uh, is there a conspiracy? You can certainly draw uh, a lot of legitimate and logical kind of, uh, you know, uh, conclusions. I mean, if you go, you can go from step A to B to C to D. Every single one of them is uh, is uh, is logical and end up uh, with the kind of the uh, the result that there is a cons uh, conspiracy. And is there? Yeah, maybe there is. But I I honestly cannot see how how it could be justified by a realistic assessment of what's happening. We're very sorry that we don't have a lot more time tonight. <clears throat> Thanks very much.